Imagine that you are a passenger on a small turboprop aircraft. You're coming back from an amazing fishing trip to the Bahamas and now you're just kicking back relaxing in the back of the aircraft. Suddenly you hear the voice of your pilot coming through the intercom and he's saying that he's not feeling well. The next thing that happens is that the aircraft starts spiraling down towards the sea below. How would you react? Stay tuned. A huge thank you to Manscaped for sponsoring this video. This is an amazing story about survival, resilience and how a group of people can come together and pool their resources to achieve something that should really be impossible to do. The story that I'm about to tell you was a flight between Marsh Harbor in the Bahamas over towards Fort Pierce in Florida, United States. The aircraft that was flown was a Cessna 208 Caravan, which normally seats nine people, but this particular aircraft only seated six, and that was because it was normally on floats, which is very common for aircraft that's flying around this area down specifically in the Bahamas. Now, I want to be clear that we don't have any final report of this event. It only happened a week ago, but we do have the statements from most of the people that were involved, but we are going to have to speculate a little bit in this episode. The flight when this all happened was the return leg of the trip. Both of the passengers that were on board had been on a fishing trip in Bahamas and now they were going back home to Florida. One of the passengers was a close friend of the pilot, so he was sitting up together with the pilot in the cockpit on the right hand seat and the other passenger was a man called Darren Harrison. He was a 39 year old from Florida who was a vice president of a flooring and interior design company and he was sitting a little bit further back in the aircraft just enjoying the views. It was a really nice day on the day of the flight and the aircraft departed normally from runway 09 in Marsh Harbor and then the pilot climbed up to their planned cruising altitude of 12,000 feet. The flight was expected to be about 1 hour and 20 minutes long. About 45 minutes into the flight the aircraft left its cruising altitude and descended down to 10,000 feet instead. 15 minutes later the pilot came onto the intercom and informed his two passengers that he felt strange and that he had a slight headache. This is apparently where he lost consciousness because after this both of the passengers tried to scream at him, tried to get his attention, but he did not respond. The pilot must have been flying manually at this point because as he lost consciousness the aircraft initiated a slight right bank and a slight pitch down. Darren Harrison, who had been sitting in the back, had now started moving forward to try to assess the uh, status of the pilot and when he looked out through the window he realized that he could only see blue waves from the uh, front right window. The aircraft was descending really fast. Harrison now reacted really quickly. He realized that there was no time to get the pilot out of his seat at this point, so he reached over his shoulders, grabbed a hold of the control wheel and then gently started pulling back and leveled the aircraft wings out. He knew that he had to do this really gently because he had been flying on a lot of smaller aircraft before as a passenger and he'd been talking with the pilot and he knew that if he pulled too quickly he was risking to stall the aircraft or even in the worst case scenario pull the wings off. He was very right in this assessment because the aircraft who had its thrust set for maintaining cruise speed was now diving at a hair racing speed. ADS-B data showed that they lost about 4,000 feet in just over half a minute and this meant that the speed was also increasing a lot. The maximum cruise speed of the Cessna Caravan is about 175 knots indicated and ADS-B data showed that they reached a speed of 295 knots, which is a lot. So the fact that he pulled the aircraft very gently out of this dive was a very important thing. After he'd managed to stop the dive, Harrison now initiated a slight climb. They didn't climb all the way up to 10,000 feet where they originated from, but he climbed to just over 9,000 feet. Now, during the dive, the aircraft had turned from a heading initially of about 285 degrees to a new heading of 158 degrees. This meant that they were now heading south, actually away from the Florida coastline. The next thing that the passengers now needed to do was to get the hurt pilot out of the uh, cockpit, away from the flight controls, and put him towards the back of the aircraft. They did so together, and after that, Harrison got into the uh, pilot seat behind the controls. He initiated a slight right-hand turn, which eventually would bring them back towards the Florida coastline again. Now, after this, his main objective became trying to ask for help, but 
it was going to turn out that that was not as easy as it sounds. Because in the commotion, when they were removing the pilot from his seat, they unfortunately pulled his headset away as well. And it seems like they actually broke the headset while doing so, because the two plugs were still connected to the panel, but the rest of the wire wasn't. Harrison instead used the headset from the other passenger who was sitting in the right seat, and he now tried to get in contact with our traffic control. I mentioned before that Harrison was not a pilot, but he had been flying a lot in smaller aircraft and he had picked up how to use the radio. He also knew the tail number of the aircraft, so he could use that as he was trying to call for help. The problem though was that the aircraft was supposed to be in contact with Miami's center frequency at this point, but somehow during the commotion, the frequency had been changed from Miami center over toward Fort Pierce, which was the airport that they were going to fly to. It's very possible that the pilot maybe had preset this next frequency and somehow as he was being removed from the controls, he just switched over that frequency from the standby frequency to the active frequency. This also unfortunately meant that the air traffic controllers that was working on the Miami center frequency had been trying to reach this aircraft for a while now, but couldn't get into contact with them, which meant that they labeled the aircraft Nordo no radio. Now those of you who have been watching my channel for a while know that if you get into a Nordo event, the air traffic controllers has to follow specific rules and regulations. In this case, the aircraft was flying from outside of the United States, they were coming from Bahamas, and they were going to enter the United States. And when you do that, you cannot be Nordo, right? You need to be under radio contact with the controllers. And since this aircraft was not, and it was getting close to the ADIZ, which is the US Air Defense Identification Zone, the controllers had to let the um, Defense Department know and they actually launched a couple of fighters towards the aircraft to go out and identify it and see what was wrong with it. And these fighters were actually close to or above this aircraft for the remainder of this event. In any case, as Harrison was now keying the mic to try to get in contact with that traffic control, he was actually contacting Pierce Tower and the following very unusual exchange took place. Traffic, triple three, let me tell you. Airman 333, Lima Delta, for Pierce Tower. I've got a serious situation here about pilot. Now, one thing that I want to point out here is just how incredibly calm Harrison sounds when he's giving this message. Remember, at this point, he has figured out that he is the only one that's going to be able to land this aircraft. He said that one of the most terrifying parts so far was obviously as he was pulling out of the dive, but he was convinced that he was going to get this aircraft down on the ground in one way or another. The other passenger potentially got into a real shock as he saw his friend, the pilot, become incapacitated. But as the flight now progressed further, he came about again and he started providing some really valuable help to Harrison as he was flying the aircraft. The air traffic controller who received this initial message was Christopher Chip Flores, and he was also very calm as he got this message. Now, he could not identify the Cessna caravan on his radar screen, so he asked the passenger if he knew where he was. And to this, Harrison just responded, I have no idea. I can see the Florida coastline in front of me, but I have no idea. Still in a very calm voice. Air traffic control now tried to get Harrison to change his transponder code to 7700, which is the international emergency code. And if he would have been able to do so, he would have been really easy to identify on the radar screen. But unfortunately, the Cessna caravan that was flying was fitted with a beautiful new glass cockpit, which is really, really good if you know how to operate it. But Harrison did not know that. So he couldn't change his transponder code, nor could he change his air traffic control frequency. The next thing that air traffic control tried to do was to get the aircraft into a shallow descent down to 5,000 feet. The reason for this was that they thought that maybe the uh, pilot incapacitation was due to hypoxia because the aircraft had been above 10,000 feet. And if they could get the aircraft down to 5,000 feet, then maybe the pilot would wake up and could resume controls, which was a really, really good idea. Another reason for descending it would have also been to look at all of the radar echoes and see which aircraft was actually following this command, and that would have helped identifying it. 
During the descent, Harrison told air traffic control that he was descending with 550 feet per minute, passing 8,640 feet. Now, these are very exact figures, and it indicates that Harrison could clearly read the EFIS controls and screens that he had in front of him, which is a good thing, and it's going to be interesting a little bit later in this story. The controllers now continue to try to identify the aircraft on the radar screen, and Chip Flores, who was still talking to uh, Harrison on the frequency, told him to try to keep flying either south or north following the coastline because they realized that it's likely that he was close to the coastline and it would make it easier to identify him. They also tried to get him to push the IDENT button on his transponder. That didn't work for the same reasons as he couldn't change the frequencies or the transponder code. But fortunately, the information about this aircraft being Nordo and flown by a passenger had now filtered down to Palm Beach Tower. And in Palm Beach Tower, a controller called Joshua Summers managed to finally identify the aircraft. But now the air traffic controllers were facing a different problem. Because they had descended him down to 5,000 feet and he was going southbound, he was actually moving further further away from Fort Pierce. This meant that he would eventually go out of radio coverage from them. And before that happened, they tried to give him a telephone number that he could call from his mobile phone. Unfortunately, he never received that number and they lost radio contact with him at this point. But since the aircraft had now been identified on the radar, the controllers down in Palm Beach Tower tried to come up with a way that they could contact the aircraft instead. And the way that they came up with was that they had an old emergency radio, a radio that they could change the output frequency on. So they brought that radio up and they changed the output frequency to the Fort Pierce frequency. And this way they could now talk to the aircraft again. As this was happening, another air traffic controller called Robert Morgan was sitting outside of the Palm Beach Tower having a break reading a book. Morgan was not only an air traffic controller, he was also a certified flight instructor. So as this was now going on, his supervisor Gregory Battini immediately paged him to tell him to come as soon as he could. Now, he was not used to getting paged, okay? That was very rare. So he had no idea what was going on as he was going up towards the radar room. When he arrived, he was briefed about the situation and he told his uh, colleagues that even though he was a flight instructor, he didn't have any experience flying the Cessna Caravan. The other controllers ran away and printed a cockpit layout, both of the Cessna Caravan with the old steam gauges and with the EFIS panels, because they didn't know what was fitted to this particular aircraft. And this, this just shows an amazing ability to think outside of the box and teamwork. I love the way that they thought about this. Once Morgan had figured out how to use this old emergency radio, which was pretty far from what he was used to when he was up in the tower, he started talking to Harrison. And he pretty quickly realized that because Harrison had no pilot experience and really small experience with talking on the radio, he couldn't use his normal air traffic control lingo. He couldn't tell him that you have to look at your 10 o'clock at four miles, for example, because that meant nothing to Harrison. So instead, he cut it back to using more simple phrases. He basically told Harrison that he knew, by the way, was a uh, Florida resident, so he was pretty familiar with the area, to keep the uh, Florida coastline off his right wing and just keep flying north. Because the uh, coastline, in Florida, runs in an almost exactly north southerly direction. And as he was doing so, he also started to get Harrison to descend slightly from the 5,000 feet that he was maintaining down to approximately 2,000 feet. Initially, Morgan thought about trying to get Harrison to land at a smaller airport further down south, but then he changed his mind and thought it's probably better for me to bring him up towards Palm Beach, which has a much longer runway, 10,000 feet, almost three kilometers long, and a runway that's also wider. So he kept directing Harrison to fly towards the north. The runway that Morgan was intending to get Harrison to land on was runway one zero left in Palm Beach. And from the position where Harrison was at this point, which was slightly south of the airport going north, that would have meant a fairly easy 90 degree right hand turn to establish himself on final. But Morgan knew that just south of Palm Beach, there were some fairly high radio antennas and he did not want uh, Harrison to inadvertently fly into these obstacles. 
So instead, he told Harrison to maintain about 2,000 feet and fly on the same northerly direction, pause the final approach, and then make a very shallow left 270 degree turn to establish himself on final instead. During the turn, Morgan concentrated on making sure that Harrison didn't lose much altitude and he was giving him really good coaching throughout as only a really good flight instructor will. But at this point, Harrison, who had been flying on the caravan before, started asking whether or not he should be starting to select flaps as well. Morgan, being the flight instructor he was, knew that if he would start to take flaps, it would change the trim of the aircraft. It would change the way that the aircraft would feel and it would be harder to handle. So Morgan just started instructing him, saying that, yeah, you, we can try to get some flaps. You have to realize that when you do so, the aircraft is likely going to start ballooning and you might have to trim forward to counteract this ballooning tendency. The aircraft was also at a fairly high speed at this point, and that could come with even more handling difficulties for Harrison. Said and done, Harrison tried to extend a little bit of flaps, but as soon as he did so, the aircraft started to be very hard to control, and he communicated this back to Morgan, who just instructed him to just bring the flaps back in again. Because fortunately, the Cessna Caravan is a reasonably easy aircraft to fly, and it's one of the few aircraft where you can do a flapless landing without too much difficulties. Up until this point, the aircraft had been maintaining a ground speed of approximately 160 knots, but Morgan knew that this was going to be a too high speed for landing. So he used the cardboard cutouts that his colleagues had given him to instruct Harrison on where to look in order to see where the airspeed was, and he told him that he should identify the thrust lever and start very gently reducing the thrust, while still monitoring the airspeed. And he said that what we're aiming for is an airspeed of approximately 130 knots, but do not let the speed go below 110 knots, which he estimated to be close to the uh, flaps up stall speed. As Harrison was now making his 270 degree turn towards an 8 miles final, something else happened to his instruments. And I'll tell you all about that after this short message from my sponsor. I'm so happy to have Manscaped as the sponsor of this video. Manscaped is a really high quality provider of grooming products for men and they've just released their latest trimmer, the Lawnmower 4.0. Now the Lawnmower is a really high precision grooming device. I use it for example when I trim my beard, but because it has some really sharp ceramic blades and skin safe technology, you can also use it to trim other places. The lawnmower is waterproof, which means you can use it in the shower or you can just rinse it in water. And it has this really cool LED light, which lights up the area that you're trimming. And I find that really helpful. If you go for the Performance 4.0 package, you'll also get the Weed Whacker nose and ear trimmer and some ball toner and ball deodorant for those special places. If you think that sounds awesome or hmm, I should get that for my partner, well then use the link here in the description below and the code MENTOR for a whopping 20% off the original price. Your balls will thank you. Now, up until this point, Harrison had had no problems giving very exact altitude readouts and vertical speed readouts. But as he was making this final 270 degree turn, he suddenly said that he couldn't see his screens anymore, that they had gone completely black. There's no real explanation to this at this point, but I have my own little theory here, and that is based on some interviews that Harrison was doing later with some local news anchors. In these interviews, you could see him sitting with a pair of Oakley sunglasses. And given the fact that he was facing north as he initiated the turn and then started turning left towards the west, it's very possible that he got the sun in his eyes as he was making his turn. And if that happened, and if he was having those sunglasses with him and he put them on, in case they were polarized, that could have potentially made him lose the sight of the screens. This is one of the reasons why we pilots are not allowed to use polarized sunglasses. Now, I'm not sure that this is actually what happened, but it is a fairly good guess. Now, the Cessna Caravan does have some conventional backup instruments that would have been visible anyway, but those ones are much harder to read than the EFIS displays would have been. In any case, Harrison completed that 270 degree turn. His altitude wobbled a little bit as he did so, but he maintained pretty much 2000 feet. And then he got the runway in sight and he started descending down towards it. 
But because he now didn't have any accurate altitude and speed readouts, he was constantly asking Morgan to update him on this. So Morgan actually treated this approach as an SRA approach, a surveillance radar approach, which is when the air traffic controllers actually does do this to normal aircraft as well, giving them altitudes, headings, speed to update them and kind of guide them down an ILS or similar to an ILS. Morgan continued to give this instruction to Harrison as he was getting closer and closer towards the airport. And he also told him that as you're getting in over the runway, the runway is going to start looking wider and wider in the window. And as you do so, you're going to have to pick up the nose slightly, continue to descend and take off the final part of the thrust to get the aircraft to touch down. The problem here as well is that as Morgan was sitting inside of the radar room, which is basically a dark room, below the tower with only radar boxes, at a certain altitude the aircraft will disappear from the radar scope and below that altitude Morgan will not be able to give Harrison any more precise instructions. As this was happening a lot of air traffic controllers had gathered up in the tower helping each other to make sure that all of the traffic on the ground, all other aircraft was held in position and out of harm's way as this aircraft was coming in for landing. After all of this drama, the landing in itself was actually really, really good. Harrison came in with a speed of about 120 knots, which is a little bit fast for the caravan. He also came in a little bit flat, which is normal because he's not using any flaps. And he touched down quite firmly. Just after he touched down, he got back into radio contact with Morgan, who was down in the radar room, asking, how do I stop this thing? And Morgan as calm as he'd been throughout this entire ordeal, just told him to use the toe brakes and to gently, gently apply braking so that you wouldn't put too much strain on it because he had loads and loads of runway. Harrison did this and actually started feeling quite comfortable with how to control the aircraft on the ground. So comfortable, in fact, that he asked Morgan whether or not he should be taxiing clear of the runway after the landing. But Morgan told him, no, no, just bring the aircraft to a full stop and we're gonna help you from there. As this was happening, several other pilots from other aircrafts all over the airport started to congratulate Harrison on his first ever solo landing. Unfortunately, this happened on the other normal frequency and not on the frequency that Harrison was on, so he wouldn't have heard that. The aircraft finally came to a full stop about halfway down the three kilometer long runway. And the next problem now became how to shut down the engine. Morgan, who'd never flown the Cessna Caravan before, had no idea how to do this, but another air traffic controller who was present, who was an old C-130 Hercules pilot, told him, just tell him to pull all of the levers back. Morgan told Harrison to do this, and when Harrison did that, that finally shut off the engine and the aircraft, and this whole ordeal was finally over. As soon as the propeller had stopped, local fire and rescue personnel ran up to the aircraft to try to remove the pilot and get him to the hospital as quickly as possible. It was later found out that the pilot had suffered a major heart problem. And the latest news that we have is that he survived the incident. And as far as we know, he's actually even left the hospital, which is just fantastic news. There is still a lot we don't know about this and the FAA has started a formal investigation and there's going to be a final report coming out of this soon. But I wanted to make this special video because it just so clearly highlights some of the main principles that I'm trying to teach through this channel. How important it is that in any circumstance always aviate, navigate, communicate. The way that Harrison, the pilot and passenger acted in this situation shows incredible resilience. He said in later interviews that as he was pulling out the um, aircraft from the dive, his heart rate was probably in the 90s. But as soon as he came to a full stop and his brain started to actually realize what had happened, his heart rate went up to 160. And it just shows how important it is to stay calm while something like this is happening, to listen to the instructions you get. And as we were saying, communicate. If the communication part would not have worked here, the outcome of this incident would not have been this good. I actually did a video about similar situation in a Boeing 737, how a passenger could potentially land an aircraft. You can check that out up here. Um, and the main point that I wanted to bring up in that was A, stay calm, B, get into radio contact with someone who can help you. And why that is important is really, really obvious here, because the way that Morgan handled his 
part of the situation. And all of his air traffic control colleagues as well, as they rallied together to come up with novel solutions like that emergency radio that they could change the frequency to and those cardboard cutouts of the caravan cockpit also shows fantastic resilience and how important it is to have and deal with talented and calm, resourceful people. This is an amazing story and I have loved researching it and I just want to congratulate all of the air traffic controllers, pilot Harrison and all of the other people that were involved to a fantastic outcome. I have actually started to teach in classes in things like leadership, resilience and decision making. And if you are interested in joining one of those classes, well then go to mentorpilot.com and put in your email address and I'll let you know when my next class happen. Now, check out this video next, which I think that you're going to find really interesting. And I hope that you have subscribed to my new channel, Mentor Now. If you want to support the work that I do here on the channel, then consider becoming part of my Patreon crew or get yourself some merch. Have an absolutely fantastic day and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.